Okay, so uh, welcome to tonight's SOA Center of Taiwan Studies um, uh, seminar. Uh, tonight I'm delighted to welcome back uh, Professor uh, Scott Simons. So Scott's someone who's um, given us a number of talks over the last uh, 10 years. The first time he was here was, uh, I think, January of 2008 at our Culture and State Conference. Uh, he then came back in uh, 2014 um, when we had our conference on Taiwanese uh, social movements, and in, uh, on that occasion, he uh, gave us a talk on uh, indigenous uh, social movements, which was which became part of our um, uh, from strawberries to sunflowers uh, social movements under my angel um, uh, book. Uh, and then, in his most recent talk, uh, three years ago, uh, he spoke at the World Congress of uh, of Taiwan Study, uh, when he gave us an overview of um, uh, indigenous studies. Um, uh, and this became part of the um, inaugural issue of the International Journal of, uh, of Taiwan uh, Studies. Um, Scott is, a, um, is based at the uh, University of, of Ottawa in the Department of Anthropology and, uh, and Sociology. Um, and in addition to being a, um, uh, a scholar of um, indigenous issues in Taiwan, he's also been someone who, like uh, a number of us here in the audience, have been trying to promote uh, Taiwan uh, Studies. So he's the chair of Taiwan Studies um, at uh, University of Ottawa that he, he runs together with um, André La Liberté. Um, um, and it's, I think it's the, uh, the longest running Taiwan Studies project in Canada. Um, so um, um, uh, we're delighted to um, uh, welcome Scott back. And the other thing I should of course say is that um, uh, he's currently on sabbatical. And um, Scott is one of these people like, um, I think, I'd probably could say uh, uh, um, many of us academics are quite envious of, of Scott because um, I'm not sure how he does it, but he seems to get a lot of sabbaticals. Um, so since I've, I've met Scott, he's, he's had sabbaticals in um, Lyon mm -hmm. um, and in Heidelberg, or Heidelberg, Heidelberg, yeah. Heidelberg. Um, and you must have had quite a lot of, of sabbaticals in in Taiwan. One. Uh, oh, only one? Yeah. Okay. Oh. Uh, but this time he's um, on sabbatical at the University of Ethnology, the National Museum, National Museum of Ethnology in um, Osaka, Osaka. Osaka, in, in, uh, uh, in Japan. Um, and the current uh, talk he's going to give us is, again, it's the, a, uh, quite a new one. Mm -hmm. uh, he'll also be speaking uh, tomorrow on uh, religion and indigenous uh, people uh, in Taiwan, same time at 7 o'clock. Um, but uh, let's now kind of give Scott a very big uh, welcome back to um, uh, London and SOAS. So, thank you, everyone. I thank David and Bill for inviting me to this. I want to thank Alon and everybody for coming here, and uh, Jaya for all of her help. And, and Laura, we had a nice discussion tonight. It was a lot of fun. So I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Um, I know there's a football match tonight, so it was a decision for everybody to come. Thank you um, for that. Um, so, you know, in Canada, we often thank also the ancestors who gave us this land we walk on. And I think it's kind of funny to be here because those are my own ancestors. But it's a pleasure to say that as well. And thank you to my ancestors. I'll say it in their language. It's just, thank you. <laughs> so... Anyway, today um, I will be going through this talk called Thinking with Birds, Ornithomancy, and Indigeneity in Taiwan. Um, basically, for these talks for today and tomorrow as well, there are publications at different stages. And this particular one is an article which I wrote in French. Uh, for the anthropology journal in Quebec called uh, Anthropologie et Société. And so the original title is Pensée avec des oiseaux, l'ornithomancie et l'autochtonie à Taiwan. Um, so basically it's a, a long-going project that I've had uh, looking at ornithomancy, <coughs> which is divination by observing the behavior of birds. And so we'll be looking at that in Taiwan as practiced by the Durugu people and the Sejek people. But it's practiced actually by 
all of the peoples in Taiwan. And it seems to be basically the same bird that everybody's looking at. Um, but it's only the Drugu and the Sedek who have elevated their relationship with this bird to a national symbol. So when I was asked by uh, Professor Frédéric Logrand at Laval University in Quebec if I had anything to say about divination, I immediately thought about this system of divination that Durugu people talk about an awful lot. Um, and I'll go through that, but I found it to be a bit of an enigma because they talk about it an awful lot, but nobody seems to actually do it or to understand how it worked in the first place. So that made it a little bit more difficult than, for example, the work that Frederick does in the Philippines where they actually still have an intimate relationship with birds in the forest. And I think that's actually very important because it shows what's happening in Taiwan with indigeneity and with indigenous rights issues. Um, in a way which isn't necessarily so flattering to Taiwan as I think some of the officials would like us to say. Um, so it's a way of reflecting upon birds and also about indigeneity and indigenous rights, which as Daphita said, has been a preoccupation for my research for a very long time. Uh, I am getting into the human-bird relationship and human-animal relationship, but I've come into that from an indigenous perspective, because it really was indigenous people who brought me to that. And it started with this bird called the Shishil, and then they took me into the forest with them and showed me how they hunt, and then I got an interest in the mammals of the forest as well. And so anyway, it's very much related to the indigenous thing, rather than to any of the uh, intellectual discussions, which are very interesting about human-animal relations that are happening in anthropology right now. And if we've got time in the question and answer, we can talk a bit about that. There are very interesting, different perspectives on animals. There's multi-species ethnography. There's the ontological turn in anthropology. There's Tim Ingold's phenomenology. There's all kinds of things going on. And I'll talk about more about phenomenology tomorrow. But there, it is quite interesting. But I think we'll, we'll stick pretty much uh, with this. And I've, rather than translating anything into English, I thought I would put together a slides which have photographs and an outline to remind me of what I wanted to talk about and then I can tell some stories that come from this article in French and if you like you can when it, it should be coming out in the July issue so it should be available next month so journals can go behind schedule who knows but it should be available <laughs> next month so anyway I'll be talking about the bird which is called the shishil and that's the uh, Sejek pronunciation, and the Drugu pronunciation is with an N at the end, Shishin. And uh, my friend Gumu Dabas has told me, you really should use that Hualian pronunciation because you're much more accurate with that. Because the L is very different than our L. It's more of a Shishin. It's always it's difficult for me. But Anyway, I'm going to talk about the enigma of the Shishin. And to begin with, I'll just talk about how... It's, it's really spoken about as being very much of a sacred animal, which has a very special relationship with the Turuku. And I love this definition, which uh, Ferdinand Pecoraro made in his 1979 Taroko French Dictionary, in which he defined it in his very romantic way, I think. And Cécile said, an oiseau de petite taille, Partenaire privilégié de l'onitomancy d'Arco. Indicateur de chance ou malchance, par son vol ou par son champ, dans toute démarche qui comporte un déplacement, une expédition. So, basically, it's this little teeny tiny bird, which is the partner, the privileged partner of the Taroko people, that tells them if they're going to have good luck or bad luck by its flight or by its singing in any activity which involves movement or an expedition. And so basically in the past they would consult this bird before going on a headhunting expedition. And so it was used in warfare. 
I think it's one of the ways in which people could get out of headhunting expedition because they could see the <laughs> they could see the bird on the path that says, "Well, we're not going to succeed anyway, so we should not do this." And I've heard that it's also been used in some agriculture rituals, and it's been used very much in hunting. And you know, I'm gonna. Well, I didn't put this in the article, but an, an, an interesting thing that happened to me after doing my research on the Shishin, I was invited to go on a bird watching expedition in Wulai Township around Taipei. This German guy was leading it. And the goal was to see the Wu Se Niao, mm -hmm. the Taiwanese barbet. Mm -hmm. So, as we're walking into the forest, I saw the Shishin on the left hand side of the path. And I said, Bruno, we're not going to find this bar because <coughs> the Shishio came on the left-hand side of the path. Uh -huh. And he said, well, what kind of superstition is that? Oh. And we spent the whole afternoon looking for the bar, but we didn't see a single oh. one. So, <laughs> so anyway, the Shishio is what they look for when they're going into the forest for something. That's very important. So I went to Taiwan, and we'll talk about that in a moment, but I went to Taiwan in 19... 12 and 13 to do a study on the Taroko people and their relationship with birds. And everybody mentioned the Shishi. And so I was quite interested in this. And I was, you know, they said it was a way in which their ancestors communicate with them and tell them if they're going to be successful or not at hunting. And they wanted to know how that worked, and nobody could tell me. And then my friend Yaya, and I, she's one of my best <coughs> friends in Taiwan, and she's uh, uh, about 12 years older than I am. She's a respected elder in the community. And she said to me, if you want to understand the shishia, you should sit quietly <coughs> in the forest and watch the bird for yourself. And in a way, she was giving a brand new research methodology of actually going out and spending time with the animals and taking notes of animal behavior. Um, but this is her house. And actually, the, the faded out screen in the background is also taken from her home. And it's a place that I like to visit every time I go to Taiwan. I take students there every two years. I took them there in 2015 and 17. We're planning another trip next time. It's a rather challenging place. I don't know, did you ever go there in the Taroko National Park? It's, it's a, for Yaya, it takes about an hour to walk up the mountain from the National Park headquarters. And then once she gets to the top, there's about a three-hour walk to her home along a fairly level path. For, that's the I at 63. For our students at 19 and 20, it took six hours Ooh. to get to the top <laughs> and then four hours along the level path. So <laughs> it's a rather difficult walk to people who are unaccustomed to walking on these kinds of trails. So Yaya's place is... Uh, there are about 15 households up there that have chosen to have some kind of presence on the mountain. They were moved down in order to make room for the Taroko National Park. And they've slowly asserted their place there. They, a few years ago, got official addresses, so the little number on their door. Uh, they made jokes about asking somebody to actually send a letter there because the postman would have to walk out of it, which of course is impossible. They just received uh, solar panels. There was actually an NGO in Tainan who raised funds so they could put solar panels on their homes. And so they just installed those in 2017 when I took students up. And so Yaya was very happy to turn on her light because she had a light bulb then. But now she has a washing machine. And so things are really changing up there. But for a long time, it was considered to be a place where people could go and get a view of so-called traditional Aboriginal lifestyle because there was no electricity or running water. But there is running water because they use the water from the streams. And it's quite nice because you can drink the water straight from the tap there, which you can't do most of the yeah, time. Yeah. On. So anyway, Yaya suggested that I sit outside and watch for the shishio. And she said it would come around every afternoon at around. 3 p.m. and eat the fruits on her trees there. And I spent two, two months, two weeks actually living up here in this house, two weeks there. And it did actually come by every afternoon about 3 p.m. and I could watch it. And at that time I had not yet taken up photography. I had not taken up bird photography at all. I just had a little teeny digital camera and I couldn't take a picture of the seal. And 
Actually, people in the villages were very confused about this. I was talking about birds when I wasn't taking any bird photographs because this is Taiwan. They all take pictures of things. And one of my major informants, a retired police officer, is in fact the person who convinced me that I should buy a better camera and that I should take up bird photography because you know, he was already doing that. And so I, I did eventually follow his advice. But I first followed Yaya's advice and sat there and watched them and took notes. And, couldn't really figure them out. It was still an enigma to me, these birds. And so it took time. I have a number of questions about the shishi that I want to talk about that. One of them is what kind of bird is the shishi? Now, in a certain way, this year in Japan, I've been learning a bit about the shishi. The one of the first Japanese anthropologists was Kano Tadao, who worked with, uh, he worked on Orchid Island, he was, uh, I don't know if you've ever read about him or his work, but he was uh, actually in high school in Taiwan and then went to university. And he, even as a young adolescent, he liked to run away from his class and go up into the mountains and meet with indigenous people. And he was into collecting insects. And, he did some of the first, uh, he did some really groundbreaking work on glaciers in Taiwan. Because everybody thought that Taiwan is so far south and so tropical that there was no glacial period in Taiwan. But he actually found evidence that there had been glaciers in Taiwan. And so anyway, he was an interesting guy. And he had an article in the very first year that the Japanese Wild Bird Society published their journal, Yacha Wild Bird. And he had an article in there about none other than the shishi. And so there was a lot of, there was research done in the Japanese period about the shishi. And it actually figures in every single ethnography about the Atayal and the Shedek and Turuku people. So it was seen as very important. But there's the question of which bird is that? And Kano identified it as the Alchipi Morisonia or the great sheet full veta. And I think that's pretty much stuck. There's pretty much consensus that that's what it is. But within the villages themselves, people would tell me, well, I'm not quite sure if that really is the shishia. And so we'll talk about that a bit. Then there's the question about what is it that makes this particular bird effective as an almond? Why is it this bird and not another bird? Because there are so many different kinds of birds there, you know. Um, the laughing thrush and so forth. But why is it this little teeny tiny bird? How does a sensorial relationship between humans and birds become part of a cultural system? So in a way, by thinking about humans and birds, we're thinking about how cultures are made. And then what does symbolism about this relationship mean in the political context of contemporary indigeneity? And it's quite of a challenge to try to think about all of this in one journal article. Yeah. But I did my best to do that. Mm -hmm. okay. So, basically I think it's uh, important to give a little bit of an overview of all of these ethnonyms that I'm tossing around here. Um, it's quite complicated. Basically, the Japanese ethnographers created the classification of nine ethnic groups. And that stuck around until Chen sui became president. And then there was this whole process of ethnogenesis in which uh, new groups became recognized. So they called it Zhengmi. So name rectification movement. And so from the Atayal group was established, the Durugu became independent in 2004. So they were no longer considered to be Atayal. They're mostly in Hualien, and they've got a population as of January of 2018 of 31,375. Basically, the name rectification movement, which I've written about, uh, was a project of the Presbyterian Synod in Hualien. And so it was basically coming out of Xiolin Xiang and with some cooperation from Wanrong Xiang and a little bit of 
reluctant cooperation from Zhuo Xixiang, and then very strong opposition from people in Nantou. They belong to a different synod of the Presbyterian Church. So we'll get into that a little bit more tomorrow, but it was a, very much of a conflict within the Presbyterian Church which led all of this to happen. So the Dorugo were established in 2004. The Sedek, who had allies in Hualien, were able to establish themselves in 2008 as an independent tribe. They've got a population of about 9,942, mostly in Nantong. And uh, so that happened then. So that's why we have the Drugu and the Sedek tribe. Uh, there's another spelling for the Taibuka, which is Taroko, and I sometimes use that word Taroko. That's from the Japanese period. So some of the Japanese ethnographies talk about Taroko and Zoku. Um, both of these ethnic terms go back to the Japanese time. So you can pick and choose your Japanese documents to say that's the name rectification that we need. Um, from a linguistic perspective, we can say that the Ataya language is split into three major language groups, which would be the Sejek, Skolek, and Chiuli. I know nothing about those other two, but I do know about Sejek. The spelling here is uh, S-A-D-Y-A-Q, is from the Pekararo Dictionary, and it means human beings. So that's the word that I use in my book, which I wrote in French. I've got a book called Sejek Balai L'Autochtonie Formosan dans tous ses états. And uh, so anyway, within the Sejek groups, then there are three dialects or languages, which would be the Drugu, which is the predominant one in Hualien. Then there are the Doda people and the Tikataya people. And they also have different names. There's the Daosai, and then the Kadai are sometimes called Blibao. And all of these names you'll find in Japanese period documentation. So um, anyway, basically those three groups migrated from Nanto to Hualien along three different river valleys and developed three different dialects. Um, they're basically numerically at about the same proportion in the population in Nanto. And so the Drugu didn't get their hegemony first through in, in Nanto. They had to find a, some form of a compromise. So they called themselves Sedek, and they actually spell it in three different ways. Every time they write it down, they've got the Sedekutsu, and then they spell it in the three ways that I put over here on the right. Sedek is, and then Sedek, and then Sedek. Because the Dikadaya people stretch out their vowels. So that's kind of, kind of complex, <laughs> anyway. But that's kind of the, uh, the way that they became those two tribes. And it was uh, a very emotional process for the people who were involved in it. Uh, most ordinary people were not involved in it, and they found it to be a rather ridiculous way that their local elites were looking for new resources. So that was happening. So the research that I've done is based on a very long process. Basically, I've been spending my whole life working on these indigenous issues. I started doing my Taiwan research with my PhD. I went to Taiwan in 1996. Um, it was only while I was in Taiwan that first time for five years, I started making indigenous friends. So I went to Ottawa in 2004, and my friends were saying, well, come back and do research in, with us. And, so I did. In 2004 to 2007, I had a three-year project called The Underside of America, Ethnic Dimensions of Development in Taiwan. And so that was about what does development mean to them. That led to a book about the relationship between indigenous people and the state. That was the book that I wrote in French. And then I was thinking about how to come up with a new project. And by about 2008, when Mai Zhou was elected, I started to get a little bit cold about politics, and I thought, well, maybe I'll, all these people are taking me out into the forest to go hunting and trapping and so forth. I'll write about animals. So in 2010, I got funding from the Ministry of Education in Taiwan to do a project on the cultures of human-animal relations in rural Taiwan. And that was kind of a test case, and I thought it was successful enough that in 2012 I went back to Taiwan and did six months of field work 
on a project called Emissaries of the Ancestors, Ethno-Ornithology of Taiwan's Durugu People. That was funded by Jiang Qingguo Foundation. And then, in order to think through some of the theoretical issues there, I had a grant from the Ontario Baden-Württemberg Exchange Program to do a project called Animism and Human-Animal Relations in the Changing Austronesian World, and that was in Heidelberg. And then, this year, I'm working on a project at the Museum of Ethnology, which is called Minpaku, the Ecological Adaptation of Material Culture in Taiwan and Neighboring Islands. And we're going to have a conference there next month that I'm helping to organize. And then there's a five-year project just beginning, which is called Austronesian World's Human-Animal Entanglements in the Pacific Anthropocene, which will take me and my colleagues and students to Taiwan and to Japan and to Guam and Palau and the Philippines. And so we've got a big project over the next five years, which is much bigger than Taiwan, but still based in Taiwan. And I think that's quite important. So basically on this map, you can see my field sites uh, that I mentioned in the article here, because I've been going around from different Turugu villages and Sejek villages. But we'll talk about the villages of Boano and Sadu, and Skadang is where Yaya's house is. And so there's three villages is where I've, the other ones I talk about in this particular article. So we can see here that they're really close to one another, but it's, the Taroko National Park is in the middle, and it's rather treacherous terrain. I love that picture too, <laughs> the dog looking across at those stones. Um, but basically, as I just said, Kano Tano identified the Shishil as the Alchipi Morasonia in the June 1934 issue of Yacho. So it's quite interesting, I think, that these birds in Taiwan played a very important role in the development of ornithology in Japan. We're not going to talk about Japanese ornithology today, but it's a, quite interesting that the way that the Japanese names for the birds are, so they often have a, a basic name for the bird, and then if there's like a subspecies where they might say the, the big heron or the little one, the lesser egret and so forth, that many birds actually, the, the basic name is from a, Jap from a Taiwanese species that doesn't even exist in, in Japan, because back then Taiwan was part of Japan. <laughs> so things have changed, and that's, that's quite interesting, but we're not, can't go can't into that right now. But those ethnographies document ornithomancy in many tribes as being important. Now this particular photograph, you can see that the dog is looking across, and you, what do you see there? What is the dog looking at? Actually, you see a road, you see a path. First. And there are probably some birds there, but there's a big rock over there at the top. Uh -huh. And that bird, that, that rock is actually related to the birds. And it's related to three different kinds of birds. Because there's a story about that rock. That in ancient times, this is a really big rock and nobody could move it. And the big animals of the forest tried to move it. The humans tried to move it. The bears tried to move it. And nobody could move this rock. And so the birds decided that they're going to move this rock. And so they got together and discussed it. And, and first of all, the jago, the crow, was going to move the rock. And the crows moved the rock and dropped it on its foot <laughs> and let out, ah! <laughs> and then flew away. And because it injured its foot, that's why crows hop around on one foot now. Oh. Right? And then the second one was the sheepy, which is the black bulbul, which has red feet and a red beak. And we'll see pictures of it in a minute, but it's the bulbul. It's called sheepy. The people make a joke. They say the name is easy to remember because it's sheepy. But these are the things you get with it for a wedding, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's sheepy. So remember that. So the sheepy then came up and thought they're going to move it. And the sheepie actually injured itself, and so it bled. And that's why its feet and its beak are red to this day. And then the little tiny, the tiniest bird of the forest, the she seal, they came up. And the she seal decided that what they have to do is they have to cooperate with one another. And all together, they'll move this giant rock. And so they were able to 
do that. And so the, the she seal did that. And then the humans were very impressed by this behavior. And so they said, we want to know your name. And the bird said, we're just a bird. I didn't reveal their name. And so the humans had to give it a name, and they chose the name Shishi. So they don't know the real name, but they call it Shishi. And then the Shishi told them that because of this, we will have a privileged relationship from now on. And whenever you go hunting, you have to look to us first, and we will tell you if you're going to succeed or not. Or not. So that's one of the myths about the Shishi. And there, there are a few others, but that's, that's basically the one we'll talk about today. So, the path is important. Basically, we see in the Japanese ethnographies, like Sayama in 1917, he said the Shishio crying loudly on the left or on the right is a good sign. So if it's on either side, and it's full of energy, and it's singing loudly, that's a good sign. You're going to catch whatever you're going to try to catch. If it's listless and has no energy, or it's crossing the path in front of you, it's a bad sign. If it's flying on either side, it's a good sign. So that's what he wrote in 1917. Now most people say, and this is you know, when I'm interviewing them, they say it's a good sign if it's on the right. So if the bird appears on your right-hand side, it's good. You'll find something. If it's on the left, it's bad. It's very bad if it crosses in front of you. In front of you, it means somebody has gotten sick or died at home, and so you should go back to the village. One person told me, this is all very idiosyncratic, for me, it's when it appears on the left-hand side of the path that it's good, and on the right-hand side it's bad. So, there's something very idiosyncratic about whether it's good on the right and left and so forth, but what's important for everything that, is that it appears to them when they're walking on a mountain path. So it's kind of like that road that I take my students up with Yaya, it's very important but they're observing birds around them as they're walking on a path. And it's very important to understand that they're doing this because they want something to eat. This happens while they're hunting. This is why I have to remove this photograph from the computer. But this is a munchak. And so somebody's trapped this. So it's important that they're trying to figure out if they're going to be successful or not in the hunting. And so we have to keep that in mind. It's, it's for game animals. They have a purpose for that. Now, the way that I got knowledge about the Shishia was for this first six months of field research is going around to the village and then talking to people about birds. And I would first of all start with free listing. So I would say to them, how many birds do you know? Let's make a list. List all the animals you know. And they, you know, we'd make a list of all of the animals in Durugulanga, the birds in, in Durugulanga. They came up with a list of over a hundred different birds. And, and then I would find out who knows the most, and then we actually had some interviews where we sat down and we made a taxonomy of the birds. So they had to group them into the higher level taxonomies and so forth. And we'd look at field guides of birds and they would tell me the name and we'd try to identify it with the birds that we had the pictures of. And so that was the way we did it. And it was happening at a time when the shishi was quite important to them. So in 2007, in they actually had a meeting, Musha, they had a meeting where the Siddic nationalists swore allegiance to themselves as the people of the Shishil. And in their handbook that they passed around, they actually identified it as being the LGP Morrisonia. In 2011, I'm sure everybody, many people have seen the film Warriors of the Rainbow. It actually shows up quite a few times in that film. There's a it's a computer animation, I believe, but there's a, there's a Shishio that flies around in that film quite a few times. At one point, Mona Luda says that we, the Shishio of the forest, are going to drive out the Japanese crow. So the crow is the symbol of Japan there. 
Then when I did those free listing exercises, what I found interesting is that people didn't always think of the she shield first. So quite often we'd go through a list of other birds and then people would say, oh yeah, it's an afterthought, you know, there's this Shishila too that we should talk about because it's our national bird. And so there was a way to do a, run it through a computer software program and figure out what this, where it comes out in terms of salience, which is the, includes the number of people who mention the bird, but it also includes where it comes in their list, and it tends to be fairly low on the list. So it came out as only the 12th most salient bird in those exercises. Very interesting, I did 21 interviews with experts like this guy here, and less than half, so 10 out of 21, could actually tell me in a field guide which one is the she shiel. So most of them were unable to do that. Now that's because they don't go into the mountains with binoculars in their hands. They're not bird watchers. Mm -hmm. And so these birds are at a distance, and they're not seeing them close up, and you can't really tell the scale from looking at a bird guide because they all look like they're the size of the page that they're printed on. So that was difficult. They would have done a better job in, in Shichu, I think. Now, interestingly, some people said that there are other birds that are also Shishi. And so they would talk about Shishil and friends. <laughs> so they're pointing out to something. that there's Shishil doesn't always come alone. We always hear the birds of a flock, bed birds of a feather flock together. And the Shishil taught me that that's not true at all. That actually birds do come in mixed flocks. And so this is one of them. So, you know, I thought about this through this research project. And then in 2015, I took students up to see Yaya, and we're talking about Shishil again. And Loging, this guy here, as he's cutting up this piece of wood, which is uh, a Lemugas tree, he said to me that what happens is that there's this tree in the forest, and we like to take good care of this tree because it has a fruit. And there are birds that come and eat the fruit, and then there are other animals that go into trees, like flying squirrels and monkeys, and they eat the fruit, and as they eat it, they drop some of it to the ground, and that attracts the animals that we like to hunt, like the munchak and the wild boar. And so, we know that where this tree lives, we're going to have the animals that we like, and that's why the bird comes to, and so that's why the bird is very good as our, an indicator of game, because wherever this shishio shows up, it means the fruit's there, and so that means the mammals are there too. And so he said, I'll show you that. And he said, come back and with me and we'll go walking in the forest in November or December and I can show you the shishio. So I decided that I would do that. So last November, I made a special trip of about 10 days, actually 11 days, to go visit Logan. And we went to look for the shishio. But first of all, we went and talked to Dada because he is the oldest person around who is very well known for his knowledge of birds. And so we went to visit Dada. And he's a bit of a traditionalist. In fact, he's probably the only traditionalist in that village. He has no interest in church. He's interested in traditional Drugu way of living with animals. And so he said, our ancestors were very intelligent. They could use this tiny bird to communicate with us. And he had this very lively discussion with me in Japanese about how if they find the right-hand side of the path, it's a good thing. On the left-hand side, it's a bad thing, and so forth. So he uh, speaks Japanese much better than his Chinese, so he's much more comfortable with that. For the Presbyterians, the Shishil is a political symbol. For Dadao, it's not. It's his ancestors. For the true Jesus Church, the Shishila is a dangerous superstition, a relic of the evils of the past. And there are all kinds of different perspectives on this bird in the villages. So, religion has changed things quite a bit. It's made the Shishila less important. I think that's why the bird showed up so low on their salience list. It's part of the story. It's not the entire story, but it, it's part of it. So anyway, Logan and I went walking. We decided that, that now I've taken up bird photography, I want to take a picture of the Shishio. 
And Logan says, I'm going to take you there, we're going to take a picture of the Shishia, I'll show you how this works and how they communicate with us. And basically, he ended up showing me why they don't communicate with us anymore. So, he takes me to Hualien, and we start in the Tarauco National Park. First thing we're having, we're going up the steep path, and there are Chinese tourists there. And they were from Shanghai. And so we talked to them a little bit, and we said, okay, we give them instructions on how to get up there. And they started walking in front of us, and it didn't take very long, maybe five or six minutes before they decided the path was too steep and they would just turn back. But it's interesting that this is a place where tourists go. <laughs> so, we walked around quite a bit. We saw acorns falling on the ground, and Logan took this time to show me how to tell if the fallen acorns indicate the presence of flying squirrels or not. He said that many young, hun young hunters from the Turugu tribe, they can't tell. So when they see acorns on the ground, they think that it must have been a squirrel that's been eating it. And it's actually quite evident, if you think about it, that the, the squirrels are after the nut itself. And so if it's the nut that's disappeared, and a little cup at the top and the branch that's fallen to the ground, then you pretty know that it's the squirrel that's eaten it. But if somebody's been eating the leaves, <laughs> and then the nut has fallen to the ground, then it's a caterpillar. But he said many young people don't realize which is which, and they are looking for flying squirrels in the place where there are caterpillars. So, he also went along looking at the paths, and he could tell, he's walking along the path looking down, and he could tell where an animal has come down the slope and emerged from the way the vegetation is broken. And basically by looking at the surrounding area and the basic size of this place where the vegetation is broken, he has some ideas in his head already. But then he can look around, maybe there will be some scat on the ground, or maybe there will be some footprints to be seen, and then he can tell what kind of animal it is. And he can guess at its gender and at its age, and can make a lot of guesses about it, and be very accurate about it. So. And it's actually, now living in the forest in Quebec, I know what animals walk around from these very signs. It's actually quite easy. But it's a form of knowledge that he has that he can access quite easily when he's walking through the forest. And it's important because he does do some trapping. So, but we looked for the shishia and we couldn't find it. And there were boobles all over that place, over the place that day. So he finally just said, today is booble day, let's go back. <laughs> so, that's what we did. That was our trip in Hualien. Then, we decided to go to Nantong, take his motorcycle across the Cross Central Mountain Highway in Taiwan. And uh, we went to visit uh, an elder in the village, Machi, who told us, be very careful of your dreams before you go. And if you have a bad dream, you should take the train to Nantong instead of the motorcycle. It's too dangerous to ride your motorcycle. Neither one of us had any nightmares, so we went ahead by motorcycle. <laughs> and anyway, we uh, were a bit more successful in Nantong. We, we went to, a village, to the village where I did research there. And, and then we headed up the mountain, the Nankao Historical Trail, which is the trail that the, Dar the Taroko people took on their way to Hualien. And it's also the trail that the Japanese used to the Taroko battle when they conquered the Taroka territory. So it's very important. And Loki taught me something interesting. In the Durugu languages, there's a different word for the paths that are taken by humans and by non-human animals. So the word for a road in Durugu for a human would be Elo. But if it's an animal or a bird, like flying down its path, a set path through these trees, from one tree to another would be its dugar. And he said sometimes they use the word dugar for human path, but only in a very special situation, like the path that that alcoholic takes to the pub every night. That's his dugar. <laughs> so, it's, so there's those two words. And that reminded me, 
this is actually one reason why I like Tim Ingold, because Tim Ingold's way of thinking about nature is very similar to this Turuku way of talking about nature. Ingold said, each such trail is but one strand in a tissue of trails that together compromise the texture of the life world. This texture is what I mean when I speak of organisms being constituted within a relational field. It is a field not of interconnected points, but of interwoven lines, not a network, but a meshwork. And so I started to think about the shishia and these humans as being part of the same meshwork of lives that include birds and mammals and fruit trees and humans. And so it's a meshwork of things. And so I think that what happens is that as these young men are growing up into men and becoming hunters, they start to have an awareness of the way that things are related in the ecology of the forest. Subconsciously, they know that there is some relationship between the behavior of the bird, the shishia, and the game animals. And Logan has tried to explain it to me in a very naturalist way. And I think he's trying very hard to tell it to me in words, which I think is it's a, a knowledge that they have which is very difficult to express in words. I think that the, in the Japanese period, it was difficult for them to express in words. So when some ethnographer came and said, do you have any system of divination? They probably said, well, what's that? And they said, well, it's a way of knowing what's going to happen in the future. And then somebody said, ah, that's our divination. And so it became that. But I think it's basically a product of years of apprenticeship as people learn how to be hunters. It's like other ways in which they understand what's happening in the meshwork of lives in the forest. Another example would be the smell of cobras, which I found very mysterious at first. Because this was on one of my very early treks up to Yaya's place, when my friend Isao, who's now working for the government, but we were walking through a place, and he said, be very careful here, because I can smell the cobras. And that just really mystified me. How could he possibly smell cobras? You know? Because he had a very refined sense of humor. Now, after years of walking through the same forest, when I get to that particular place, I can actually smell the mustiness of the cobras. They are there, and they do have a smell. But it, it takes years before you realize what that smell is. So, but what's happening is that these trails are becoming more and more populated by hikers. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of tourism going on in Taiwan, and hikers drive out other animals. So things are happening there, and you can't hunt what people are <laughs> hiking on, right? So anyway. Ornithological knowledge on the El Chipe. So I'm just, I consulted some of what ornithologists have said about this bird, because I wanted to see if that's similar to or dissimilar from what Logan and Tada and other people have said. And I found very interesting. It's often very complimentary. One thing is that the, shish, the El Chipe, which is the ornithological way of saying the Shishil, is the most numerous and dominant species up to 2,800 meters. So basically, this is the bird most commonly seen in Turugu hunting territory. So geographically, it covers the same space as the Turugu. But it covers a larger area than other birds. And so what happens is the shishil is going along its dugar, its road, and it's going through different parts of the forest, some of which are occupied by different other kinds of birds who will follow the shishil for part of its, its search for food. And so other birds join and they leave, and the ornithologists call them multi-species flock. And so that's why the Durugo call it Shishil and friends. So basically they're pointing to the same reality that the ornithologists will call a multi-species flock. These flocks come together not during the whole year, but they come together during the non-reproductive season for the birds, which is the important part for the ornithologists, which is from September to February, and that happens to correspond to the Turugu hunting season, which traditionally happened after the millet crop. Now the, crow, the cry that it makes is loud and repetitive. 
So basically what's useful for the birds is that the shishil is the one that tells them where the food is, so they follow it along. And then it also cries out when there's a predator. And when there's a predator from the sky, like a hawk, it makes one cry and dives down into the bushes. And if there's a predator or a possible predator from below, so this is what's important to the hunters, if there's a boar or a muntjac or something walking underneath the bush, then it makes another cry and it flies upward, and that's when the hunters will see it. So I think basically what happens is that if there's a, a mammal walking underneath the bush in a place where the hunter can't see it or hear it, but a bird sees it or hears it and then flies away, then they see it on the side of the path. And depending on the particular terrain of their hunting territory, different hunters will see it on the left hand or the right hand side. Because that's, they have you know, dangerous cliffs and so forth, and so it really depends on where the vegetation and the pathways are. And so I think that this particular cry and behavior of the bird is actually something that exists in nature, and that's when they were asked about, do you have a system of divination, that it became a system of divination. So anyway, finally, Logan and I saw a shishio, which emerged on the right-hand side of the path. And it's a very small, loud, and rapid bird, so it made it very difficult for me to take any respectable photos, and I was lucky enough to get one good photo. There were a few others that were okay, but this one was good enough. So I was very lucky and happy with that photo. The shishi. So, I think there are a number of conclusions to make. The Shishil is the Alcipi Morrisonia and its friends. I think the best way to think about the Shishil is that it's the prototypical species in a multi-species flock. So actually all of those other species of birds, like the Mejiro, the white Japanese white eye, and so forth, that come along with it for part of its journey are also Shishil, but they're the friends. The shi the, I'll keep you more so be the prototypical shishio. <coughs> All the others are kind of the ones that come along with it. Some of the really experienced people could give me the Durugu names for all of those. I think that the shishio is a part of a meshwork of communication that's happening in the forest. We don't feel this today. None of the Durugu people feel this today because we buy our chicken and our fish from the supermarket and we're not hungry when we're walking along the path. We're not dependent on catching anything. But I think for a long time it was very important that they be attuned to the other living things around them in a meshwork. And there are ways in which species communicate with one another. And the shishio was a very important part of that. When they were asked by ethnographers about systems of divination, this sprang to mind. Ethnographers wrote it down. It became a defining characteristic of Durugu culture. So Durugu culture, in a very real sense, emerges from humans thinking about and talking about the relationships that they have with other creatures. It's not the relationship itself. It's talking about it makes it into culture. Now what happens in, in Taiwan is because they hunting has been criminalized, hunting by daytime, so diurnal hunting, is no longer possible. And these birds come out in the daytime. So nowadays when they go hunting, they tend to put headlamps on and they go out at night and they shine the lights around in the forest and then the light reflects from the animal's eyes and then they can shoot the animal. Most hunters are actually elderly people who trap. So that's not where you would need a bird to help you identify the location of the animal. You would use your own eyes to figure out where its dugar, its path is, and then lay your trap. So they don't really need it to hunt anymore. And so it's faded away from memory. It's only because it's written down in those ethnographies that it became a symbol. And so now the shishio is a political symbol. But I think it's a very potent and important one because it says... We are the people of the Shishio. We are the people of the forest. 
And these colonial policies have removed us from the forest. And there's a, we've lost something there. And so we need to have our forest back. So it's a very potent way of claiming territory. And so I conclude my article in this talk by saying I hope that in this case it's also a good omen or a good augur for their future. So thank you everybody and these are my acknowledgments for the people who have been very supportive of my research until now. There's quite a number of organizations that have been involved. So thank you everybody for your attention. Take okay. okay, thanks, Scott. So that was something very, very different. This, um, I think. I mean, I think we knew from the, the title of, of, of the talk it was going to be something uh, fresh and original. But we really, just like all your previous SOAS talks, we really got a sense of your kind of passion for field work, mm. but a very different type of, um, uh, of field work. And I wasn't originally aware about. How long you've been involved in this this project? Mm -hmm. So it's it's um, um, it's almost ten years since yeah. you started this, this kind of uh, human animal um, relationship mm. uh, research. Um, one of one kind of character I was really interested in in your talk was Locking. Mm. Um, and was that his book that he had in his hand? No, 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 no. Because um, I was thinking about to what extent is his real rich knowledge actually being lost. Mm. To what extent, for example, do um, uh, youngsters actually listen to him? Mm. Um, but, um, is he able to actually pass on that knowledge to those young hunters, or do they just think they, they know it anyway? Okay, so you mean the elderly man? Yes. Ah, oh, okay. So, but yes, oh. I see what you mean. Yes. Yeah. So basically, the book was the uh, the guidebook to Taiwanese birds, okay. mm -hmm. and he was very interested in that, so he, he wanted the picture taken there. But Dadao, I think he's doing a really good job of, of passing on knowledge. Mm -hmm. I think that the people will go to him if they want to learn how to hunt in that forest. Okay. Mm -hmm. So younger people do go to him, and in addition to the people of his own village, there are Taiwanese people who go there. Because he runs an ecotourism lodge. Ah, okay. So any of you can go <laughs> and see him. <laughs> and uh, so I think he does a very good job of that. And one thing that he does is he really emphasizes the, the, the value of Taroko culture and traditional knowledge. And he's one of the ones who has always done the sacrifices in the village. <laughs> so... When everybody else is doing their church things and there's a pig killing, he's the one who takes a little tiny bit of each piece of meat and wraps it up in a leaf and then ties it to a tree or some high place. Mm -hmm. So I think he's keeping those memories alive for people. And now there's a whole generation of young indigenous people going to Donghua University and taking courses and doing theses and so forth mm -hmm. about indigenous issues. And they go and talk to him. So I think that he's a very important national treasure for them and a very important resource. And he is getting quite old and we don't know how long he's going to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, you know, he's, I think maybe 87 years old now. And is he still walking? He's still walking. Right, okay. He's amazing because he's still walking up that path carrying rice for his customers. And he's much better at walking up that path than, you know, most 20-year-old Taiwanese people are. Um, you also talked about uh, religion, about the difference between the Presbyterian and the true Jesus mm. um, uh, uh, church. Mm. So would this clash just be, even just be within one village? Mm. Okay. Yeah, that's right. So basically most, like across Taiwan there's, there are differences. The Catholic Church is much stronger in the South, mm -hmm. the Paiwan and the Lukai people. Mm. But in most villages, there are competing, somewhat competing churches. The true Jesus is more of a Pentecostalist, they speak in tongues and so forth, and then the Presbyterians. Mm -hmm. So, but it generally is not individuals that choose to go to one church or another. It's the whole Allah, or the whole clan, okay. mm -hmm. that converts to one. So, Basically, it'll be all like it's almost like a 
there's a strong relationship between the, the kinship structure and then the church denomination. So does that mean then that the um, the true Jesus Church would kind of completely um, reject traditional indigenous culture? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, oh, okay. so they're they're very fundamentalist, and so what they encourage people to think of, and they don't have the idea of culture that anthropologists do. It's a little bit different, but mm -hmm. they 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 want people to think of a rupture, and that the the past are all evil spirits. Like this, she's she is mm -hmm. a, a demonic spirit that they're supposed to remove from their life. So they're not allowed to have that as part of their practice. And some of them were even afraid to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so some people would say to me, well, we shouldn't even be telling you these things. Now, I understand that you're an anthropologist, you're interested in her traditions and her culture, so we'll tell you. But it's very dangerous to talk about that. So some of them are really hesitant. Okay. So if, I mean, if we think, okay, uh, if we think about things like indigenous social movements, then mm -hmm. they would completely reject those as well. I wouldn't say that they completely reject. Okay. But they're definitely not as interested as the Presbyterians. Right. Mm -hmm. And the Presbyterians are the ones who've been the leaders of the social movement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's move to some more questions. Yeah. Go ahead. And then... Well, thank you so much. Um, Oh, that's right. Okay. Um, the thing that, one of the things that really surprised me, I don't think you mentioned about the calls until you got to the ornithologists. Mm -hmm. and, and that really, you know, because you, you would have thought that, that was very much the craft of, you know, of, of, of hunting and so on. So, and I, um, is, and is that, would that be more to do with locking being a trapper and therefore not needing to actually f you know, look for the bird, the birds themselves. I, I mean, most people, that kind of small bird, they're much more likely to hear than to ever see, mm. surely. And, and it kind of surprises me that there didn't seem to be any, any folklore about its calls. It was all about the rest. Mm. Not bird song. Yeah, well, it's more of a call than a bird song because it's it's mostly the predator call that's important. When it's because that's when it identifies something. Mm. And I think you're right that there's not that much to talk about the calls of the birds. And I think that just like we are, they're more interested in the visual parts of the birds. And that's an interesting observation, actually. Because we, in anthropology, we tend to think that Western society is very visually oriented and that somehow other societies might be yeah. using other senses more. Yeah. But I think that the Turoko people are using their eyes as well to look at birds. And Logan is definitely using his eyes to look at where these paths are for the animals. That's a very interesting observation. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'll... Yeah, I'll and thank you very much. Okay, I'm, I'm interested on the mesh work. Mm. So this is very interesting, the uh, kind of um, ideas, mm. okay. So normally we say about network, mm. right? Network is a point, mm. but much work, you say much work is a line. Mm. So um, the first question is, much work, because you already translate from indigenous language mm. into English, mm. so I want to know um, in in Chinese character. Okay. Well, how does this mean? Oh. Mesh work. Well, the, you're talking about like the, the dugar and the elu, or the mesh work? Because we have to we have to come up with a word for it in Chinese characters, wouldn't we? Um, but if Chinese uh, character, what 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 would be? Zhongwen. Zhongwen, so so. Okay, so. Mesh work. Ewen. It's a different word in English, in English too. I mean, who knows what mesh work means? But, it's not a mile because that would be a network. Oh, yeah, man right? is a network. Yeah. But now how mesh work now? We'd have to come up with something different, wouldn't we? Yeah. yeah. Oh, what would we call it? Maybe. Could I suggest tartan? Huh? Tartan. Could I suggest no. tartan? No. Maybe wash work. Wang. Wang. It's very difficult. It's a new yeah. word, because yeah, even in English, it's a new word. Mesh so, is much more. No. Not tartan, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> no, because this this is a, a way I've been thinking about European culture. 
rather than these isolated things developing everywhere, it's yeah. actually always been interconnected. Yes. Yeah. Interconnected. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I see this is interesting because um, kind of uh, network is more kind of interconnected point. Yeah. But this uh, mesh work is more kind of interweaving yeah. the lines. Yeah, yeah. So I think this we need to come out a good translation. Yeah. In Chinese. I wonder how is typical gold been translated into Chinese? Do you know? Um, no. <laughs> maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> but maybe. I don't know. I mean, just the first thing, maybe. You... Well, when they say this, they only say in indigenous language. They never say in Mandarin. Well, the thing is that mesh work mesh. is from Tim and Gold. It's Tim not from indigenous language. No. Oh, Tim and Gold. So the words from the indigenous language were Eloh and Elo. Dugar, which mean road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's the line that's there rather than the points. So that the the, the idea is there. Mm -hmm. But they've never said anything that would be translated as mesh work. That's no. Tim and Gold's work. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, Tim and Gold. Okay, yeah, interesting. And also, you use the long part of the mesh work of communication. Uh -huh. So normally we think of the part to be the small part or larger part, but uh -huh. you use the long, long part, P A R T. Uh -huh. Yes, long part. Yeah, the long. Yeah, long part. Yeah, so I think it is interesting. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Eva. Okay. Uh, just as a matter of interest, I I, I apologise for using the S word again. Oh. But there, there, there is a Scottish Gaelic um, uh, saying: uh, "It is a pity for the one who goes to the shore when the birds themselves are deserting it." Mm. So um, uh, that is a reflection of man's interaction, I think, with. Um, with uh, other animals. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, my question relates to the first question. Uh, you mentioned um, the crows uh, had a meeting to discuss what they should do about removing the stone. Can you tell us uh, which language they had that discussion in? Uh, the reason I, I mention this is because several years ago there was an article in Le Monde um, which uh, discussed um, a species of bird, I've forgotten which one, from, from Western Africa whose call changed as you move north. Mm. So, so in the article, that they, 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 they describe this as a different dialect that was used by the bird. Um, but my real question is this. Um, most people um, consider if the, if the bird is on the left-hand side, that's a bad thing. Mm. So, um, of course, in East Asia, in the, in the areas affected by Chinese culture, certainly, um, to be left-handed is seen as a bad thing. I'm left-handed. Mm. In Europe, uh, uh, to be uh, in some languages sinister, you know, um, to be left-handed is considered to be a bad thing. Where does this idea that left-handedness is bad come from in indigenous culture? Oh. Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I, I, I think that I, I don't know where it comes from, but I think there's an interesting book that I read. Actually, it's a 19th century <laughs> book by a German ethnologist named Ludwig Hopf. Ludwig? Hopf. Hopf. And he uh, actually took the time to go through the ethnographies of his time to look at birds and the, same, the signs that they make and how it's used in fortune telling. And he found that this is pretty much a human universal, that the left-hand sign is considered to be the bad mm -hmm. sign. Mm -hmm if birds are on the left-hand side rather than the right-hand side of the path. And I think that the, when I talk to people about it and they gave me all kinds of different answers and when we go back to the Japanese ethnographies and we see that it's not always on the left-hand side, that the actual relationship with the birds in the forest, the left-hand side is not the bad side, but somehow as people are thinking through it and talking about it, the left hand becomes the bad side. And it seems to be a human universal, but I can't explain it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so is that direct on this one? I, I just want to talk about yeah, French go. for left. Yeah. Yes. Gauche, right? Yeah. Gauche. yeah. So is that linked to English? You know, gauche is a bad thing. Yeah. It, is it? It is linked to that, yeah. That's what I wanted to say. Mm, okay. <laughs> but yeah, uh, B, you get it. Oh, thank you. Good. Oh, oh thank, thank you. you. Um, 
because I, I, I have to say I echo quite a few uh, questions, but I want to follow up. Um, the first is um, actually um, I was quite taken by the, the phrase you use, um, meshwork of lives. You know, this is such a beautiful picture you, you portrayed. It's such, such a harmonious uh, thing. So I'm just trying to ask you, um, because of the, you mentioned about the tourism, uh. and what sort of the impact bringing into this meshwork of lives? Yeah. That's one thing. Another thing is talking about uh, the, the, the involvement of church. To what degree that really uh, actually challenging the traditional way of life and has um, the, 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 if, um, the enhancement of the uh, indigenous people's status um, sort of bring that back as a more valuable mm -hmm. asset for them. Thank you. Yeah, I think the tourism one is very important because one of the things that I learned from this trick with Logan was just how present tourists are in the mountains in Taiwan. But he made money out, of, or make a living out of it. Yeah, well. Loking does because he's a guy. He's a porter. He carries things for tourists, right? Mm -hmm. And Dado is because he's a he owns this lodge at the top of the mountain, and Yaya takes in tourists. So they, these people are all making money from tourism. Okay. But the tourists are obviously increasing in numbers, and they're displacing people from their territory. They cannot hunt, even now that they're legalizing hunting, on the same paths that are being used by tourists. And even if you were to say, well, they're hunting at night, the tourists are there by the daytime, or even if the tourists are on these nicely cultivated paths and then the, hunt, the people who trap are making their own paths, the fact of the matter is that if they're are a lot of hikers, then the animals go further up the mountains or they find someplace else to go. And so the animals are not as present because they can't overlap with the hikers. They try to move away from people. And obviously you can't put traps where somebody might step on it. And so they're, they're displacing hunting and trapping and indigenous life ways. And I think that's a, a threat to them. So that's something that really needs to be explored a, a lot more, especially by the, by the indigenous people themselves. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, the, the church the, has its impact. That's what I'm going to talk about tomorrow. I don't want to get too much into sure. that. <laughs> uh, I mean, did you get a sense of um, uh, any anti-tourist sentiment? I remember in your talk in, in 2015, yeah. I think you talked about uh, where communities had blocked a road. Mm. That, uh, yeah. um, to what extent um, is this an issue in this area as well? Yeah, yeah Tongman, they blocked the road. Mm. And that was because there was a village inside, more closer to the mountains, mm -hmm. that was getting nothing from the tourism. It was the village that was on the outside was bringing them in and walking through that territory. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of an internal conflict there. But everywhere I've been, there's been an idea among people who are not benefiting from tourism that mm -hmm. it has its negative impact. Okay. And they want to talk about that. So even in this particular place, they were talking about the, the behavior of tourists mm -hmm. who you know, would walk through their property or even look inside their home and say, you know, they're just... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Are leaving trash, right? Mm -hmm. And it, it was I was horrified by that trip to Nanto on the Nangal Trail. That there were places where humans had defecated on the trail, mm -hmm. and so it was filthy. It was really a dirty place, and it was so it'd be a good idea if they started hunting the tourists. Now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In some, some, I mean, um, for example, in, in Gaoshan, one of the things that struck me is, is um, different types of tourists have uh -huh. different uh, images. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, tour groups have a very bad image with yeah. big tour yeah. buses. Yeah. Same thing. Uh, while independent tourists um, have a better yeah. reputation. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and and you, you talked about the case where you met up with that, um, the group from Shanghai, uh -huh. who didn't the climb very far. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, to what extent is there any kind of anti-Chinese sentiment mm -hmm. in some of these discussions? Yeah. Does that come up? It's come up. It didn't come up ahead of time. But right. It, it's come up. They like to joke about the ones, the Chinese tourists that, that died because of um, getting hit by rocks. Ah, okay, in, in, in the Tarako. In the yeah, yeah. Mm. And so some of them joked and said that their ancestors don't like the, the Chinese tourists ah. coming. <laughs> and some of them joked and said the monkeys don't like the Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, okay. that's, oh, that's going on. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Is Sisu an onomatopoeic word? And are there many onomatopoeic words in, in these bird names in, 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 in these languages? Yeah, I don't think that she she is, but I think there are a lot of them. Mm. And like the the Chinese bamboo partridge makes a sound that becomes its name. Duk -a -duk, duk -a -duk. <laughs> so very common. Okay. Any um, final questions? Oh, go no, better you no, be no, there. No, no, no. I just want to say if you are bothered by left and right, you just turn around, then it'll turn into a different direction, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. So, so it made no sense. If you look at a bird turning on your left, you just turn like this. Then you but you've got your path, path though. Because, because you're walking along a path. Oh. It's definitely going to make me Flexible. kind of change the way I, um, I, I walk. And, and uh, uh, I'm going to keep thinking about it. Right? The bird's on the left, on the right. Does that mean something? Yeah, but the birds are moving all the time. So if you're walking forward along a path, uh -huh. mm -hmm. You, you, and it's on your left hand side, it's not going to let you walk in front of it and then turn around. It'll be gone by the time you turn around. Okay. Yeah, but so humans, about is it humans your are heart? animals. I uh -huh. just wonder if any other animals have this prejudice. I wonder too. Because mm. they, they might. I mean, you never <laughs> other primates might have this prejudice. Mm. Okay, yeah, Craig. Thank you for your talk. Um, Oh, thank you for your talk. Uh, it's really interesting inside of this area, but um, not from academic background myself. So, I'm curious if you today, because believe me, most Taiwanese people probably don't know this bird as well as you do, of course. If you're about to tell a friend, a Taiwanese person, say, why you should know this bird, what is the simple thing you can tell them? Why we should know this bird? What does it mean for Taiwanese people? In the simplest form. Yeah. I, I, I think that it's maybe not that particular bird, but I think that everybody, not just Taiwanese people, should be familiar with the other lives around them. <laughs> and take an appreciation, because the birds and everything, they, they, they make our world in a way. Birds move seeds around, so they move plants around. They're, I think it's important to really appreciate the ecology that we live from, to understand the relationship between different lives in order to say, well, we need to protect that forest, we need to protect that wetland. Because there's often an argument that maybe we should put the economy first, we should put a factory there. And I think people have to learn to appreciate the other lives that are disturbed by human development. Because otherwise, we live in an increasingly polluted and nasty world where it's a world of death. <laughs> so, I think that's an important lesson. And if Getting them interested in any bird gets them interested in nature, then that's a good thing. <laughs> By the way, is um, um, is this the only case where an indigenous um, um, nation has chosen a bird as its national symbol? Oh no! Oh, okay. What else? Canada. Oh, <laughs> oh no! I mean, oh, within, yeah, I mean sure. within Taiwan, do other um, oh, Taiwanese nations peoples. or peoples? Uh, adopt birds as their. Not that I know of. Okay. okay. So, so what? Why 
is Trukul different from the others? Yeah. The, uh, is it some, do you have a theory about that? I think that they like this little teeny shishia because it's small and they have this idea that it's very cooperative with one another. Mm -hmm. And I think it fits into their political philosophy of not having big leaders and... Uh -huh. yeah. mm. Was it because they are a small tribe, so they, they, they think they are working together actually make things work better than the more powerful, bigger people? Well, they tend to have this political ethos of not wanting... It's called Gaia. Mm. which is the idea that one should not accumulate power or wealth for oneself, that everybody should be equal. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so there's a big criticism of anybody who tries to stand up and become oh. better than others. That was in the film, Warriors of the Rainbow. Mm -hmm. It was part of the critique yeah, of yeah. Mona Luda at the beginning of the film shot somebody and said, never walk in front of me. Because there was an idea that him wanting to be that leader mm. was a moral flaw. Okay. Oh, it's really interesting. Mm. So I think that it kind of fits into their political philosophy. That doesn't mean that they thought through it consciously, but I think that it, it does. Gaia. Gaia. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think on that point then, um, we can continue our discussion over some, some, some wine. So thanks yeah, again, thank Scott, you. and um, we'll be uh, back uh, here tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow at at, uh, at 7. D okay. Thank you. Oh, oh, DLT, yeah. sorry. Oh, DLT. DLT. Okay, great. Thanks.